Okay, so this morning, I want to welcome all of you to uh, New Covenant House. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Femi Omotayo. I am the lead pastor of this church. I always tell folks that I, I don't consider myself the senior pastor because we don't have any junior pastors. Amen? In the eyes of the Lord, we're all co-servants, co-laborers with Christ. Amen? Christ calls himself the elder brother. He doesn't call himself the senior brother. Because when you talk about senior, there's always an implication that there's a junior. Right? So anyway, welcome to New Covenant House. I'm glad all of you could make it this morning. Um, it's, a, it, it's just an interesting season that we are in as a country. And I know that there's a lot of news, there's a lot of uh, tension, there's a lot of pressure. So I want us to just take a moment, just a quick moment, and just pray for the leadership of this country. Pray for the, the president, pray for the people who advise him, the people who surround him. Let us just pray for him. The Bible says pray for your leaders. They, they, they have influence over the peace that you enjoy or not. So let's just pray that the Lord will grant them wisdom, that the Lord will fill their hearts with wisdom. The Bible tells us that all authority is ordained of God. That means it is God that has put these people there. Let us ask him to to just give them the wisdom to, to lead us, to lead this country in a way that will be a blessing to us, but will also glorify his name. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless you. Almighty and ever-living God, we give you praise. Father, we commit your sons and daughters, whom you have put in positions of authority in this country. We ask Almighty God that you will fill their hearts with wisdom, with knowledge and understanding. Let them, almighty God, make decisions that will bless us, but will also glorify your name. We give you praise and we give you glory. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Um, if you're here this morning and we've never met, or we haven't met in a long time, I will be standing by the front desk. I'd love to say hello after the service. Amen. This morning, I'm going to conclude a sermon series uh, on the topic of prosperity. I'm going to finish it this week. I'm not going to talk about it again next week. But what we're going to do is, after the service, I'm going to sit here and answer any questions you may have on that topic, because I know it's a bit of a controversial topic, and people have been, you know, uh, throwing questions here and there, but I'd like us to learn from each other. So after the service, please, if you have any questions, wait behind. This is a judgment-free zone. We all learn from each other. Amen? Also, on the 15th, I'm not supposed to make this announcement, but I'm going to make it anyway. There's nothing they can do. They can't do anything to me. Femi can't do anything to me. <laughs> on the 15th of September, uh, my Bible Study Connect group will be starting. So, if you want to be a part of that Connect group, don't hate, don't hate. Please, on the 15th of September, 6.30. Amen? So what does it mean to prosper? What does it mean to prosper? From the perspective of our creator, from the perspective of God, what does it mean to prosper? We took our primary text from the book of 3 John, chapter 1, and we read from verse 2. And it said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Now, if you've missed the first two parts of this series, please, please, I encourage you, Go and listen to it. It will bless you. People have said things to me like, PF, it set me free. Yeah. It, 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 it just gave me a, a great perspective on this issue. I don't usually advertise sermons. This one, I'm encouraging you. Go and watch it on YouTube. And it's free. Amen? Amen. So we've looked at prosperity simply means doing well. That's what it means to prosper. It means that you are doing well, but not doing well in the sense that we usually 
say that the person is doing well. When they say that, oh, AK is doing well, what they usually mean is that she's doing well financially. She's doing well materially. Nobody says she's doing well because she's healthy. Nobody says she's doing well because she's happy. Nobody says she's doing well because her spirit is strong and is growing. We usually say she's doing well when she is prospering or doing well financially. But that scripture we have just read says, Beloved, I wish, I pray that you may do well, even as your soul does well and your body does well. Amen? When we do well in one area of life and we're not doing well in another area of life, then we're not prospering as according to the way that God defines prosperity. To prosper in God's eyes means that you're doing well in your spirit, in your soul, in your body, and in your finances. When you focus only on one area and you're doing well there, you are out of balance. You are out of equilibrium. And you're not prospering. And it's not only that you're not prospering. Sooner or later, the impact of the deficiency becomes apparent. Yeah? God's will for you and I is that we do well in every area of our life. Now, the challenge is this. If you pursue balance in every area of your life, that means that you may not have as much money as the person sitting next to you. And that is always hard for us to accept. And the reason why it is hard for us to accept is because we are driven not by the will of God, but by our flesh. The Bible calls it the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. We are driven by a desire to acquire more, even to our own detriment. So we want more stuff, and more stuff, and then more stuff. And that is a problem. When we pursue the acquisition of material things to the detriment of our souls and bodies, we are out of balance. It is important that we can meet our needs, fulfill our obligations, but it is also important that we are emotionally and spiritually healthy and physically healthy. It is critically important that we are spiritually healthy. No matter how much money you have, if you are sick in your body, you cannot drive that Lamborghini. Yeah? You can't drive it. If you are, uh, 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 you have a mansion, a 20,000 square foot mansion, but your spirit is weak, when you go to bed at night, the devil will afflict you and you will not sleep well. And if you sleep well, he's waiting for you in the morning. I, I know that a lot of us are very good with pursuing wealth. We have learned how to hustle. Yeah? The hustle is real, and we don't play with it. You know what I'm talking about? We, <laughs> we have learned how to hustle. Yeah? So we, we, we've learned how to, how to do well financially. And some of us are very fastidious about our health. We only eat organic food. Yeah? We walk out fastidiously. But you know something I have noticed? That since the lockdowns of 2020 happened and churches were shut down, a lot of people have started to neglect their spiritual well-being. You know, I know some folks are genuinely concerned about being in a crowd, you know, and the, and the virus and the pandemic. So they don't come to church and they watch online. They don't go to restaurants, yeah? They walk remotely. They will never get on a plane. I was on a plane this morning, and the person sitting next to me, I, I, I made my mask tighter. <laughs> because I just, anyway, let me not go there. He might be watching. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so, you know, these folks, you'll never see them at the airport. You won't see them on a plane. They won't go to the gym. They have all their groceries delivered because they are genuinely concerned about being exposed to the virus. And that's okay. But then there are some folks who do not avoid any of those places except church. They go to the parties with the crowds. 
they go to the gym with sweaty people, breathing heavily. They are at restaurants where people are chewing with their mouths open. And they have no problems getting on crowded planes. Listen, I'm not talking to you guys here because you are here. The folks at home. If you can get on a plane, you can be in church. If you can go to the gym, you can be in church. If you can attend a party, you can be in church. Amen? Amen? And you know, I, 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 I did a wedding yesterday, and on the way back from the wedding, I saw some guys, and I'm like, they, and they're like, oh, I'll see you in church tomorrow. And I'm like, how are you going to get from Houston to Dallas? I say, oh, we'll watch online. <laughs> and, and you know what? I, I don't have to be. That's okay. You can watch online, but you can join the party via Zoom too. You can order your groceries from Instacart. You can do your exercise from your garage. But there is something about being at that party in person. You know what I'm talking about? There is something about working out with other people that motivates you. As you are lifting the weight and you see them lifting more, you are um, gingered to do more, yeah? And there is something about worshipping with other people who share your faith. The Bible says that there is a time and a season for everything. We must be careful that we do not become spectators to what God intended for us to be participants in. Yeah. And I'm not just saying this to jazz somebody. Turn your Bibles with me very quickly to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. We're going to read a couple of really long verses of Scripture today. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, hallelujah. See, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest, over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider... Hallelujah. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Not giving up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more, Hallelujah. as you see the day approaching, people are talking about this must be the end times. Yeah. Things are happening, and the same people will not go to church. But if it's a party, they're there. And they're hoping they won't see anybody in church at the party. Because even they know the writer of Hebrews said, since we have confidence in what God has done for us, since we have faith that we are righteous with God because of what Jesus did, let us do three things. Number one, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. Number two, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. And number three, let us encourage one another towards love and good deeds. Listen, when was the last time you encouraged anybody? He's saying the new covenant, the fact that you are saved by grace through faith and not by works, the fact that you have been uh, uh, released from obedience to the law, 
should compel you to encourage your brother, to encourage one another towards love and good deeds, and not giving up. Meeting together as some have done. So, you know, one of the challenges, right, when you tell people that, and when people read in the Bible that we are no longer under obligation to the law, it, they, they interpret it to mean I don't have to do anything that I am uncomfortable with or I don't feel like doing. But Paul is saying in these verses, that very fact compels you to encourage one another. Because without the law, you know what helps us? The way we encourage one another. The way AK says to me, Femi, calm down. You're going too far. The way I say to Larry, yes, all things are lawful, but is that really expedient? When you are in your, in your pajamas, in, your, in front of your TV, who is encouraging you? Or better say, who are you encouraging? <laughs> there is a time and there is a season for everything. The Bible says the sons of Issachar were wise because they knew the times and the seasons and they knew how to respond appropriately. And some of us are not responding to the times and the seasons. And it would be remiss of me to fold my hand because it doesn't really, in real terms, it hasn't really changed anything for us as a church. But I, I, I see the laxity. I see how God is no longer a priority for folks. And I don't want to, you know, have a church full of people who only pray when there's a problem, who only worship when they're looking for promotion, who only serve because they're hoping a door will open for them. God will bless you whether you come to church or not. Yeah? <laughs> when I was growing up in the faith, all the Christians in the denomination I belong to, every Friday night, once a month, every Friday, one Friday of the month, the first Friday, they would, everybody would go to this camp on the outskirts of Lagos. And the traffic jam would be horrendous. And I did not like going there. And people used to say to me, well, PF, if you don't come, God won't bless you. I said, if my God cannot bless me unless I am in a particular location, then that God is too small for me to give my life to. So this is not about whether God will bless you or not. It's about whether you will be a blessing or not. Amen? Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, let's move on. So let me preach the sermon I want to preach today. If it, but let me just say this. If it is safe enough to get on a plane, it is safe enough to be in church. Yeah? Do we agree? Yeah. What did I say? If it is safe enough to get on a plane? So anybody who tells you COVID, tell them don't fly. <laughs> Seriously. Anybody you know who is getting on a plane and is not coming to church, call them out. Yeah, seriously, call them out. What are they going to do? They can't beat you. <laughs> if they beat you, call 911. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. So turn your Bibles with me quickly to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to read from verses 5 to 12. That's seven verses. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Let me read that verse again. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that... 
Why is God blessing you abundantly? So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Verse 9, it says, as it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of what? Your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can buy more cars. You can build, 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 build bigger houses so that you can wear bigger belts with bigger buckles. No. So that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You know, one of the reasons why we we pursue wealth at the expense of everything else is we do not understand why God gives us wealth. Amen. We really do not understand why God blesses us materially. These verses that we have just read basically describe to us why. It was a long reading, but I wanted us to hear it from God's mouth. In verse 8, it says, And God can bless you abundantly, so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, having enough to pay all your bills, meet all your obligations, you can abound in every good work. In summary, it is saying you are blessed with an abundance so you can bless abundantly. And that is something that is missing in the body of Christ. We want an abundance so that we can consume in abundance. We want more so that we can eat more. But Paul is saying to these folks, God will give you an abundance so that, yes, you can meet your needs. You can pay your bills. You can send your kids to school. You can pay for your car. You can put gas in your car. You can pay your electricity bill. You can pay your gas bill. You can pay your cell phone bill. But you have enough to abound in good works. You have enough to be a blessing. My brothers and sisters, God blesses you so that you can be a blessing. He blesses you so that you can be a blessing. In verse 11, he says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Let men see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. People do not praise God because of your car. Nobody's going around and saying, man, he's driving a Porsche. Praise be to God. Nobody does that. Nobody's like, man, look at Larry's house. Praise God. No. When he blesses somebody, when I bless somebody, when we extend our hand of generosity, they're like, who is this their God? That is when they want to know our God, when they taste the benefits of our God, not when they see us consuming. When they see us consuming, guess what? They're envious and they're jealous. And they look for ways to tear us down. And the church will continue to face opposition from the world as long as the church is not a blessing to the world. 
God said, I, I, <laughs> I, I am enriching you. I, oh my God, do we pray for enrichment? Do we pray? Pastor Charles was telling us about praying today. We pray. And those of us of African descent, prayer is like an occupation <laughs> for us. You know what I'm saying? And when I say African descent, I mean recent African descent. Those of us who just got off the boat. Some people are looking like me like, which boat? You know the boat. <laughs> we pray. We pray. We pride ourselves on prayer. When we're looking for a church, we say, that church, do they pray there? Do they pray there? Because, you know, I didn't come to this America just for fun. You know, I, I need a place, Pastor Charles, where they have a man like Pastor Charles. That's why we have Pastor Charles here, so that he can pray. Did you see how he started the service? We told him to come and do opening prayer, prayer points. Say, everybody that is in your way that does not fear God and does not fear man, pray. I saw people. <laughs> Listen, God answers those prayers so that you can be a blessing. Hallelujah. But, <laughs> do you know why we pray so fervently? So that we can consume. Super problematic. The reason why we have an abundance is so that we can be a blessing. And let me tell you, <laughs> the reason why some of us don't have an abundance is because we have no plans of being a blessing. How many of you have thought about winning the lottery and your first thing you were going to do is change your number? <laughs> Seriously, change your number so that nobody will know. And if they know, they cannot find you to get from you. Or those of us who will say, oh, okay, do you know what? I'm going to win the lottery. I will give PF something. I will give the church something. I talk about the spiritual ones, the carnal ones, don't remember PF. <laughs> I'll give PF something. I'll give the church something. I will give my brothers and my sisters and my friends something. All of this something that they are giving has made up less than 5%. Then they are thinking, ah, I only have 95%. Do you know what? Let me give PF less. Let me give the church less. Let me give my siblings less. Because we don't think in terms of generosity. We think in terms of consumption. Some of us have been blessed abundantly, but nobody can accuse us of being generous. It is either we increase our consumption or we hoard it out of fear of losing it. And we do not get praise from men. And we get no praise to God from men. You know, one of the things that happened during the lockdowns of 2020 is that a lot of people were seriously affected. Some folks lost their jobs. Many businesses suffered great losses and had to lay off staff. Some people had their hours cut considerably. Some people couldn't even pay their rent. A lot of people went into serious financial difficulty. This congregation was able to help them. This church covered the rent. No, 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 no. don't clap unless we're giving praise to God. This is not about the church, it's about God. We, we were able to help them. And I'll tell you how. The church covered the rent and the mortgages of quite a few people throughout that pandemic, delivered food on a regular basis to quite a few people. A lot of those in the medical field, in the front lines of the battle against the coronavirus, received some kind of care package from the church. We did quite a lot, and we spent a lot of money trying to help people. Do you know why? Because this is one church. I don't know about other churches, but in this church, we're very conscious of the fact that we cannot consume everything that comes in. We cannot, oh, we have some more money, let's build a bigger hall. Oh, we have some more money now, let's buy cars for all the members of staff. Because at the end of the day, that money is not to enrich ourselves beyond what we need, it is to be a blessing 
to the people of God. And the church is not a building, it is people. The church is a model for the way that we live our lives. Yeah, we don't take a camera around with us every time we deliver a check. You know, we don't post it on Instagram every time we drop a basket of food in somebody's house. We don't need to use the hardship that somebody is going through to promote this church. You may not know it, but through this church, your generosity is causing people to give thanks to God. If you have a need and we know, we will help. And that is why we are here. But why are you here? You cannot hide behind the church. You can't hide behind the church. For you to hide behind the church, then you need to be giving a considerable amount of money to the church. Are you? I, I don't know. I don't check. If you are, thank God for your life. If you are not, do better. You know, I won't lie to you. I, I didn't always understand this. I, I didn't always understand the reason I was blessed was to be a blessing. So I consumed. When, my, when the income in my family went up, guess what? We upgraded. Yeah? We upgraded. She's earning a little more money, we get a bigger house. She's getting a little bit more money, I buy a better car. A little bit more money, I trade it in and get a better one. Seriously, that was how we lived. But then, I'm looking at the Bible. And I'm like, why, why do you think this is the right way? And I realize the message that we have been taught is we give so that we can get. The giving is a means to an end. And the end is us. We give so that we can get. And when we get, we acquire all the stuff our hearts desire. But stuff never satisfies. It never satisfies. You know, <laughs> there are many ways to get stuff. You can get stuff through your work. If you work hard, you get stuff. You get a paycheck and you get stuff. If you have a really good business, you get stuff. If you can defraud the government, you get stuff. But I'll tell you something about the stuff. The satisfaction you get from stuff is very temporary. That is why we want more and more and more. Because those things will never satisfy. You know, I, I, I look at myself in the mirror sometimes and I'm like, are you mad? What are you thinking? I, I want a new car. How old is my car? A year and a half. I bought it brand new. It's a nice car. When I step on the accelerator and I go, I leave a lot of people behind. <laughs> a lot. And he's not struggling. It's just, I'm already thinking of a new one. Because that one no longer satisfies. But it wasn't designed to satisfy. It can never satisfy. In John chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus says, Whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. He says, indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The stuff will never satisfy. It, it, it just can't. It is not in its nature to satisfy. It's like, you know how when you're thirsty, super thirsty, and you go get a bottle of soda, it will quench your thirst for a minute. A minute. Just a minute. And the next thing you know, you want another one. And another one. And still you are thirsty. But there's a, there's a water you drink, ice cold water, that one glass of it will do for you what five cans of soda cannot do for you. The stuff that we acquire are like those five cans of soda. You just keep adding more to it. And one day, you yourself will ask, when will this end? Let me tell you, it will never end. If you will not be satisfied. It's the nature of those things. When we left Lagos, and I've told you guys this story many times, 
I used to drive a car that did not have any air conditioning. Okay, well, that was the upgrade. That was the upgrade. The first car I was driving, the steering didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that car? It worked occasionally. You would, if I'm going to turn right here, I have to start turning the steering here. <laughs> and hope that by the time I get to my exit, it will start working. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes it started working early, and I had to turn before my exit. <laughs> and I said to myself, Lord, if only you can give me a car that the steering works. Guess what? The Lord gave me a car. The steering works, but it didn't have any air conditioning. Lord, if only you can give me a car with air conditioning. And then I got my Mazda 6. Air conditioning, steering that worked. Praise the Lord, somebody. Lord, if only you can give me a car with more horses. Then I got a car with more horses. Lord, this is the 2018 model. I want the 2019 model. I have the 2019 model. When is it going to stop? Now I want the... It's hybrid now. I'm trying to conserve. I'm trying to protect the environment. So I want the, elect I want the electric one now. That's the one I want, the electric one. Because I'm trying to protect... It, it, ask me if I care about the environment like that. <laughs> I hate to say this, but the honest truth is that the environment is not my priority. My priority is I want a new car. And then I will find an excuse and I'll get another one. And that is, how, that is not how to live life. It says, whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. If you are thirsting, you're not drinking the right water. You know, if you look throughout the Bible, there is not one person from Genesis to Revelation who gave a penny to God so that they could get. Read it. Not one person said, you know what? I'm going through a tough time. I want God to bless me. So I'm going to sow a seed to get a blessing. It didn't happen. Solomon, our favorite guy, Solomon sacrificed a thousand head of cattle. A thousand head of cattle. And the Bible says that night, God knocked on his door, said, Solomon, what do you want? Can I ask you guys a question? Did Solomon know that God was going to visit him that night? Was Solomon thinking, I need a divine visitation. Let me sacrifice a thousand head of cattle. No, Solomon was just trying to worship God. He was just so grateful for what God had done. He was doing it out of reverence. He was not trying to manipulate God to visit him. He was not trying to rend the heavens. He was just trying to be a blessing to God. We think, the way that we think is, is messed up. Nobody in the Bible does that give so that you can get, yes, God blesses you, but that's not why you give. That's not why you give. He did not sacrifice the cattle to provoke a gift from God. He did it out of worship and reverence. Solomon was not expecting a visit from God. The problem with the way that we have been taught prosperity is, 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 it is wrong because it feeds off our greed. And our covetousness, it not only feeds it off, it, it stirs it up. It stirs up our greed. Instead of stirring up worship and reverence and gratitude. If you are grateful to God, bless him. If you see a need and you are moved to compassion, and you should be, be a blessing. If you want to worship and reverence God, be a blessing. Melchizedek, Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of his income. Was he trying to rebuke the devourer? He saw Melchizedek. He says, the king of Salem, the king of peace, I worship you. Take. 
And God responded by blessing him. We don't do things out of worship. We don't give out of worship. We don't give out of reverence. Some of us, using my local parlance, we don't send God like that. And do you know how we know? The minute we don't need anything from God. The minute we don't need anything. It will it, be okay. It will be okay. But when we need, when we need from God, oh my God, we're zealous. We're zealous in everything. But when we don't need, that's when we remember, it's okay, I don't have to tithe. But once things start getting tight financially, say, oh, maybe it's because I'm not tithing. Then we start tithing again. Because we, we, we attach the reward. We're motivated by the reward. And it's a problem. And I'll show you why it's a problem. You know, before I do that, let me just show you something in, uh, in verse 10 of that Second Corinthians. It says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. He supplies seed to the sower and he supplies bread for food. That means that God gives you enough to sow and enough to eat, right? Will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of what? Of your seed? Of your righteousness. When you give, God increases your ability to give and then enlarges the harvest of righteousness. Do you know what righteousness is? Righteousness is being in right standing with God. You know, a man of God described this phenomenon in a way that I understood. He said, God loves everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah? But God likes some people. Do you understand what I'm saying? I love everybody, but I like my wife. You know, there's some people that are special. That's my guy, man. <laughs> God sent you to me to encourage me. But it's true. God said David was a man after his own heart. David, God said to David, David, this temple, you're not going to build it. Your son is going to build it. Right? And David had amassed all of this wealth. If you and I were David, what would we have done with all that wealth? Say, so, well, you know, I, I tried. I said to God, Pastor Charles, I told him I want to build. He said I shouldn't build. So let me go to the south of France and buy myself a nice mansion. You know what David did? He took all of that wealth, gave it to his son and said, build the Lord the temple. He didn't consume it. I can't build it. You build it. And then when God says, David was a man after my own heart, you think it was because of the songs he used to sing? So we'll come and we'll say, I want to be like David. I'll sing all these wonderful songs. But my wallet, <laughs> stay in your lane. And, 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 and this, and we're talking about prosperity here. What it means to prosper. When you understand that prosperity is more than money, that is when you start to prosper because your focus changes. Your, your, your gaze shifts. Yes, you have bills that have to be paid, but there are other things in your life that matter just as much. And you will not pursue wealth to the detriment of your soul, of your spirit, of your calling, of God's purpose for your life. I can love you doesn't mean I like you. It's the truth. And we have to come to that place where we understand the way God thinks. In James chapter 4 verse 3, and this is where I'm going to stop because my time is up. James chapter 4, verse 3. Can you guys pull it up? It says, when you ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives. 
that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. We don't, we don't talk about, we don't, we don't, we don't, <laughs> we don't talk about this in church because when you say this too much, people stop coming to church. Say, <laughs> say that church, <laughs> they don't want me to prosper. <laughs> I want you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. It is of no use to me if you have money and every day we're praying for divine healing for you. It is of no use to me every day we're praying that God will remove the spirit of depression from you. But you have money. It is of no use. You have money but your marriage is in tatters. Every day when they talk about your children, you, your head goes down. That, of, of, of what use is that? There are a lot of things that money can do, but there are a heck of a lot of things that money can't do. Do you know the bad thing about money? Do you know the bad thing about money? When you die, they can bury you in a gold casket. Somebody will come and blow, just brush your bones to the side and take the casket and... And you, you spent all your life. Sacrifice your marriage. Sacrifice the relationship with your children. Sacrifice your spiritual development. And someone else is going to blow it. If, they don't, if the first generation doesn't blow it, the second generation will blow it. When you ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. What are you planning to spend the blessings of God on? If God were to answer your prayers right now, your prayers for blessing, your prayers for material things, not prayer for husband or healing, your prayer for money, or your, not prayer for wife or children, your prayer for money. Is there anybody who is, who is not praying for money? Let me pray for a liar now. Seriously, is there anybody who is not praying for money? Who is not? You bet, I thought my wife wanted to lift up her hand. I wanted to just go and tell her, say, my friend, you, don't I know what you are praying for? Seriously, jokes apart, jokes apart, I'm faffing around. What are you planning to do with that money? What are you planning to do with that money? Is it, I want God to bless me so that I can have a roof over my head? You already have a roof over your head. I want God to bless me so that I can have a car. You already have a car. Well, I want God to bless me so I can eat well. Diabetes. <laughs> These are the things that we're not talking about in church. And I'm tired of it. And I look at my life. I grew up on these things. And I can see the problems it is causing me. And I'm a few years ahead of most of you. I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I made. I don't want you to fall into the rat race. Because right now, I'm trying to get out of it. And it's hard. Capital One is waiting. <laughs> Bank of America is waiting. American Express is standing at my door like this. And that's what happens. That's what happens. When you run the race, you run the race, you're not, you're not succeeding. They'll tell you, don't worry, we'll give you some. We'll, we'll help you. Zero interest for three months. And after the three months, you don't read that. They said after that, it's 25%. If you are late once, it's 35%. That's how it happens. So why are you asking God to bless you and I'm closing here? So that you can have more or so that you can be a blessing? The answer to that question, the true answer is easy to know. Very easy to know. What are you doing with what you have now? What are you doing with what you have now? What you have now? How much of what you have now do you consume? How much of what you have now is bringing praise to God? How much of what you have now is causing thanksgiving to rise to heaven? 
Let us bow heads and pray. I know that this was a bit of a tough sermon. I've tried to temper it with some humor. But let's not be deceived. This is a serious thing. The Lord says, I wish above all things. Above all things. It's high on God's list of priorities. It's not a, an after thought for God that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God desires strongly that you do well in every area of your life. That is his desire. And you can come to him today in prayer and say, Father, thank you. Thank you for wanting that for me. Thank you for wanting me to prosper. But thank you for wanting me to be in health. Thank you for wanting my soul to prosper. Thank you, Father, that you are looking for balance. You want balance in my life. You want me to be in a place of equilibrium. But Lord, help me. Help me to understand the role of your blessings in my life. I am blessed to be a blessing. I am blessed to be a blessing. I am blessed to be a blessing. If you are bold today, I want you to say this prayer with me. That Father, going forward, going forward, as you make all grace abound to me so that I have a sufficiency in all that I need, I will abound to good works. I will be a blessing. I want to challenge somebody here today to be a blessing. Not just to yourself, but to the body of Christ. To your community. Not just to the people who one day will bless you back. But to those who may never know your name to even say thank you. Not those who will celebrate you because of your gift, but to those who may even despise you because they didn't know the gift came from you. I want to challenge all of us this morning. God's gift to us is so that we can be generous. I want to be a generous person. He said in every way, in every way, he wants to enrich us. In every way, my brothers and sisters, and yet some of us complain when people ask of us. You know, I often tell people I would rather be the one that they are asking from than the one that has to ask. But you know, the tables will turn if we don't make proper use of what God has given to us. And this morning, if you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, the only option you have in life is to keep drinking the water that will never satisfy. The water that you will drink and you will never thirst again, that water is Christ. It is Christ that fills us and helps us to rise above the lust of our flesh, ab above our covetousness and our greed. 
This morning, if you, you're here and you've never received that water that will cause you to never thirst again, I want you to just say this prayer with me. Father, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the water that I will drink and will never thirst again. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you will give me this water. Give me Christ. Lord, I accept that Jesus died for me. I accept that his blood was shed for me. I accept that on the cross of Calvary, his life was taken to make atonement for my life. It was not taken from him by force. He gave it up for me. And I received that gift. Thank you, Father. Thank you for water that I will never thirst again. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed.